Tejasvina Aditamastu Mavin Visha Vahai Om Shanti 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 Om May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace be unto thee, unto us, and to all your beloved children everywhere. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday morning talk. Uh, this morning, the topic is the Karma Yoga of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov uh, uh, the, is the, 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 the term Baal Shem Tov means master of the great name. Tov, the great name. Uh, Baal Shem, master of. Uh, and we'll find out about this interesting character from the 19th century and how he arose to be of great service to his people. Uh, but before we, before we go ahead with that, I'm going to ask Cindy Craven to read a poem by St. Francis of Assisi that uh, lets us know why it is so, why we feel such a strong need for these saintly personalities to take a uh, human form. Uh, and this is a wonderful poem by St. Francis of Assisi expressing that urgent need. So Cindy, if you would be so kind. Okay, good morning, everyone. Our Need for Thee, sent by St. Francis of Assisi. If our ever present need for, in our ever present need for thee, beloved, let us know your peace. Let us be instruments that break every shackle, for do not the caged ones weep and give us our inheritance of divine love so that we can forgive like you. And let us be wise so that we do not wed another's madness and then make them in debt to us for the deep gash their helpless raging lance will cause. Darkness is an unlit wick it just needs your touch, beloved, to become a sacred flame. And what sadness in this world could endure if it looked into your eyes? God is like a honeybee. He doesn't mind me calling him that. For when you are kind, sweet, he nears and can draw you into himself. What is there to understand of each other? If a wand turned the sun into the moon, would not the moon mourn the ecstatic effulgence it was once was? We are all in mourning for the experience of our essence we knew and now miss. Light is the cure, all else a placebo. Yes, I will console any I will console any creature before me that is not laughing or full of passion for their art or life, 
for laughing and passion, beauty and joy is our heart's truth. All else is labor and foreign to the soul. I have stood in his reign and now fell granaries as do the fertile plains. Giving is as natural to love as sound from the mouth. There is a courageous dying. It is called effacement. That holy death unfurls our spirit's wings and allows us to embrace God even as we stand on the earth. Thank you, Cindy. What a beautiful, beautiful evocation. Darkness as an unlit wick, only needing your touch. There is a self-effacement. And this is what these great souls do. These great souls don't come for themselves. They don't come for name or fame. They don't come for uh, any material gain. They come only to serve. And of course, we have some more recent ones in our in our experience. Gandhiji, Martin Luther King, the Dalai Lama. These are great souls who have given much on behalf of their people, given their lives on behalf of their people. One of these was the Baal Shem Tov. Now the Baal Shem Tov lived in the 19th century, a time when Russian Jewry, at least that that lived in the rural setting, was much afflicted by the culture. The, the affliction was called pogrom or pogroms, and it was vicious. What would happen is these uh, Jewish peasants would develop some land, take undeveloped land, make it arable and uh, able to produce crops, at which point it would be seized, seized by, by the authorities or by um, the, whoever was deputized by the authorities. And so this went on and on. And the, the, there was no way of organizing uh, against this because you know what happens when we try to organize against uh, that kind of viciousness. Uh, that viciousness is just increased and uh, so the, the people were just in a shambles. Out of this came this strange young man. Strange young man, by this I mean, he was orphaned by one of these pogroms. His parents were killed and he was given into the care of his uncle. Now, his uncle didn't have much time for him. Uh, sent him to school only as much as was necessary. But the young man that would become the Baal Shem Tov had a lot of time on his hands. And he spent this time in nature. He, like many others, Meister Eckhart is another great example, St. Teresa of Avila is another. They learn from nature. They learn from nature, the nature of reality. Well, the uncle, taking note of the fact that this young man was becoming very deep and very broad in his understanding of the natural world and its application to spiritual 
progress and spiritual effort, delivered him into the care of one of the great uh, saintly personalities of Russian Jewry at the time. Of course, these people were very secretive. Uh, and so this was all done in secret, secret. But he was given into the care of this great soul who then opened up for him even further uh, experiences of spiritual life. Now, as he came into his young manhood, he began to offer great service, just personal service. There's nothing organized. He didn't have a, a, a retinue. He could just offer personal service to others. And of course, he became known for his saintliness and his service. This is the karma yoga that I mentioned. He served others. And of course, karma yoga is a selfless action. So he served others and became known. Of course, they didn't use that term, karma yoga, but they used their own term to describe how selfless he was and how much he was. But what happened was a, a number of people rallied around him. He didn't form a group, but a number of people rallied around him because of his selflessness and his service. And so it became a stronger and stronger group of people who were not pushing back against the authorities. They were simply assisting one another following his model. This became the foundation of what we now know as the Hasidim. Now they were very different in those days. They were very communal, very selfless in their service to one another. The modern Hasidim, uh, as, as so often happens with uh, spiritual traditions as they age and mature over centuries, they become more rigid and so on. So the modern Hasidim, we mustn't think that this is how the Hasidim that were founded by uh, the Baal Shem Tov, uh, he didn't invent that term. And it was invented by these people who were his followers. They call themselves the Hasidim. So he then lived out his life, giving this great spiritual and everyday sustenance. That is to say, you can do this. You can manage to live through these pogroms. You can manage to live a life of value. And one of the things that he said that is so instructive to us is that nothing is so gratifying to the heart of God than the simple prayer of thanks of these Hasidim for giving them the opportunity to live and prosper. Nothing is so gratifying. So if we offer from our hearts that simple prayer of contentment and gratitude, then uh, we can imagine a relationship of, of love and well, that exists in any case, but it enriches and fulfills that relationship of love. As I mentioned, there are modern examples of such beings. Of course, Gandhiji. Was Gandhiji a perfect being? No. Was Martin Luther King a perfect being? No. Is the Dalai Lama a perfect being? Probably not. 
do they do they and have they served their people and even offered up their lives uh, as a, as a sacrifice yes they have so with that is there anything that anyone would like to offer about what has been said or the saint francis of assisi poem that was read anything at all from anyone about any of that all right dears let's let's just go over then this development of this young man and compare it to that of Meister Eckhart. Meister Eckhart was also a young man with much time on his hands when he was just a boy. Of course, he was not yet a monk. He was not yet Meister Eckhart. He was just a young man who spent a lot of time in the forest. And one of the things that we can discover if we spend time in the forest, this is the testimony of these saints, is that there is a natural order, a natural order that we can relate to as a spiritual world, but it's just the, the natural and beautiful order ordained by the divine as the creative force. And when we see this, and of course there are members of this congregation who make a great effort to see this. Uh, they go into the woods with, the, with this idea of seeing this natural order and perceiving the creative behind the material behind what is apparent, there is something that is not apparent, which our spiritual practices help us to discover or uncover. So Meister Eckhart, as a young man, spent a lot of time in the forest. And he later became a monk. And in one of his poems, he said, I lost my way in this intellectual uh, way of uh, approaching spiritual life as a monk. I lost my way. And I had to go weeping back to nature and ask her to teach me again what she had taught me before. And then I was able to harmonize the two. Now, we don't know what happened to Martin Luther King. We know certain things that happened to him, how inspired he was by, by the work of Gandhiji and how he was instructed in how to do nonviolent social change. So, someone is saying something. I'm not. I'm. I'm not understanding what's being. Who is? Who is that that's speaking? I think it's Umaji. Umaji, you need to mute yourself. We hear background noise. So is there anything else from anyone who would like to discuss that one? I, I just, uh, when you were talking about Meister Eckhart going, weeping back to nature, <laughs> um, I, I resonate with that as the kids say. Um, 
I'm, I don't know. It was just my temperament, I guess, but it's always been hard for me to just, you know, something works for me spiritually and then I stick to it for the rest of my life. I, I, when I am in a particular practice phase or whatever, um, personal era, I get into, I, I, I dive deep, but I don't always, you know, of course I don't stay in the deep dive, um, because I'm not an enlightened being, but sometimes because of external things going on, always because of external things going on, um, I, whatever that particular practice was, let's say it's chanting a mantra, uh, let's be concrete, just isn't working for me. It's like not working for me. And I don't mean, I'm not talking about mud mind and all that. I'm talking about, I am feeling bereft and that is not helping. The mantra is not helping. I will go somewhere else, usually that I have been before, whether it's nature, into the woods, um, relationships I have with people and my animals. Um, I go where I feel the divine is. And I, my faith is only in that there is something. I don't know what it is. I enjoy it in different forms and modes at different times. Um, when I am mo at, at having the worst times of my life, and I've said this before, I ask myself when it seems the divine is missing, missing in action, I just ask myself, what, what is here? What remains? And for me, that's always this, this thing called, that I call love. And it's this bit way bigger than human, just relationship love, although it comes through that real strongly. But all that said, um, you know, nature can bring somebody back into a church, you know, it's, it just depends on the person. But I, I feel that for me, it's very important to follow, you know, if I feel like, okay, this practice isn't working, saying this prayer isn't working um, for me right now, and I need something that works, I will pull something else in. Perfect. And I get, because I want to maintain that connection. Well, that's it. There is that yearning to maintain that connection. The need for thee. That's why that St. Francis of Paul, St. Francis of Assisi poem is so moving. Our need for thee. Thank you, Cindy. That was very eloquent. Anything else from anyone? Yes, Brother Shankara, this is Sunil. Um, about St. Francis of Assisi poem, uh, poem uh, what we talked is that darkness is an unlit wick, only needing your touch. What I was contemplating about my life, I didn't know I was in dark. So that was the turning point, which was led, you know, uh, it, yes, th it is an unlit wick, but I need to know that. I need to come to that point. And I did not come to that point unless uh, until life uh, or the universe put me in the corner. Then I started realizing about myself. What is this? And the journey was not pleasant for me. It's been only two, two and a half years now. But I had to go through that dark night of the soul to touch that wake, to light that wake. Just wanted to have my reflection on it. Well, I'm so glad you told us that. And I'm so glad the wick was lit. And two and a half years is not a very long time. Uh, you, will, you will look back in another two years, you'll look back and you'll say, I'm amazed at who I was and how much I have changed. So persist, my brother. Persist, my brother. 
that that little flame that has been ignited just blow on it gently feed it you know some cotton feed it some small tender and turn it into a roaring flame it will become a roaring flame and you'll find when you read in the testimony of the mystics one of the good places to read about this is in that book love poems from god which is where that saint francis of assisi poem came from love poems from god the testimony of 12 illumined souls talking about how they each went through this darkness before uh, the light overwhelmed them and eventually it does indeed overwhelm us so thank you so you thank you anything else from anyone hey shankara it's tom can you hear me okay yes, i certainly can hello everybody so uh first thing uh i love being here i love coming to this thing i love looking at all of your bright shiny faces and I'm happy that uh, so many people have their cameras turned on today so I can see you. Uh, this is something I continuously mention. And yeah, it's just great to see people on the screen. Uh, and somebody, a number of people have said to me, well, if somebody doesn't want to, want to turn on the camera, they have their reasons for that. And I'd say that's fine. But then if I want to ask you to turn on your camera i have my reason for that too so it all balances out so uh what am i thinking about the the difficulties along this the so-called spiritual path all the really hard times and the frustration and so on the way i now more and more i think i just want to enjoy the journey you know just moment by moment my life unfolds and rather than uh always craving some big awakening in the future moment just pay attention to this moment and there's all kinds of little awakenings that, that come along uh and even when i when i look back and think about my darkest hardest times they were dark and hard but looking back on them it all seems like a big adventure you know like i went through this horrible thing and I kept moving forward and I went, I went through this really difficult thing and I kept moving forward. It all seems like sort of a big adventure. So there's, a, there's a book. I, didn't, I haven't read the book, but I love the title. It was called a uh, journey without goal about the spiritual path, you know, and that's the way I see it now. I, I don't know if there's any big final goal at, at the end. Uh, but I just really like, yeah, step by step, this moment, this moment, this moment, uh, just just doing the path. Uh, and there's there's little awakenings along the way. And sometimes I think laughter is a type of awakening. There's something about laughter. It's just you let go of everything for a moment. You see things differently. You're free. You you have this big laugh. And then it passes. Uh, I wouldn't want to be laughing all the time, but it's great that I that I experience laughter from time to time. And I wonder about the awakening moments. Maybe I wouldn't want to be awake all the time. Maybe I I uh, it's just great to have an awakening moment. You know, fall back into you know the mundane mind. Have I don't know. Anyway, I just wanted to hear myself talk and say hi to everybody. So that's all I got, thanks. Well, thank you, Tom, as always, for your very straightforward and authentic uh, uh, telling us how it is for you. And uh, yes, indeed, we have our dark times and we then, and it is not, there is, this is, we're told over and over by the spiritual teachers, there is no final goal. You're an infinite being, part of an infinite universe. How can there be anything final about the infinite? And so we, we go on, we go on, we go on. And as, as 
Sri Krishna says in chapters one and two of the Gita, you know, this garment that we wear for a time, this stardust spacesuit, is just a garment. And when it's worn out, we drop it. And for a time, we, come, we become unavailable to the senses of other human beings. But then we may take another form and they may not know that it's the same uh, being taking another form. We may not know ourselves, probably will not. But nevertheless, that's all that's happening. We go on from moment to moment to moment. One of the things that happens is in this moment to moment to moment, for some people, it becomes clear to them that there is a need for this selfless service in those moments. Not, not that there's this imperative from the great scope of things. No, just in these moments. Cindy was speaking earlier about uh, you know, her uh, involvement with creatures, cats, squirrels, so on. She's very serviceful toward them. I know this. I know her. And I know other people who are the same. Uh, so it's just a matter of what is in this moment and what does it call forth from us? From, for some, it calls forth a, a, a big organizing attempt, like Martin Luther King's uh, working with all those young people and working for all those years to get the Voting Rights Act passed, you know. But uh, we, we each individually know what is in each moment. The more carefully we look, the more we find, the more we discover. And this is why we turn within, why we practice spiritual practices, so that we turn within and learn that you hear that voice, the voice of silence it's called, the voice of silence, which communicates to us very, very moving and transformative things that we would never ever discover otherwise. This is the seeking, I'm, I'm seeking for the Atman. I'm seeking for the Atman. Anything else from anyone? Well, I'll talk, I'll talk some more since nobody else is. <laughs> Tom's wandered off to get another cup of coffee, I think, but I just wanted to let him know, if you can hear, Tom, that we, li <clears throat> we like to hear yourself talk, too. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to say. I'm thinking a lot of stuff. I think everybody's in kind of a... It's not that we're not here. <clears throat> and it's not that we're not paying attention. It's just, we're just kind of sometimes, you know, when you're with people you've known for a long time and that you feel comfortable with, and sometimes you just want to just sit and be with those people. And I think sometimes that's just what we're doing when everybody isn't jumping in and talking. It doesn't mean that we're not present with each other. Oh, no, I feel... I, I feel it, too. <laughs> and, yeah. There he is. There he is. Did you get us a cup of coffee, too, Tom? <laughs> um, and, you know, since we don't get to do this in person very often, uh, you know, we do it here. 
And sometimes it's nice to just kind of be with each other and it doesn't really matter what we're saying. Um, Shankara mentions my servicefulness to, to critters and, uh, you know, I, I, I have two cats right now and one is older and he's not doing very well. Um, and I just, I sat with him for a long time this morning and, um, he's really not feeling very well, but he just, he just curled up next to me and just this really quiet purr. And, you know, I, I know he may not be long for this world, but I just, I feel like I love him so much, but I am so willing to let him go. I don't want him to suffer one more second than he absolutely has to. And, um, and I feel that way about my own life. I really do. You know, I like being here. I'm not at all interested in dying right this minute or tomorrow or, but I'm fine if I do. I'm just, I think about death a lot and not in a morbid way. I always have. It's just, it's the most fascinating thing about life to me, or one of them, one of the top ones. And I just feel like so often we avoid it. We don't think about it. We don't talk about it. And then when it occurs in our life, we lose someone or some pet or something, we're devastated because we... I'm not saying we're not going to miss these beloved ones, but, you know, I think it's such a great opportunity to really get the feel for what it is we believe, you know, what do we believe? And I think that's what I was doing this morning with my Mozzie Meowski cat. Um, because I do think animals and humans on a level are sensitive to our neediness. And if we're just, you know, don't leave me, don't leave me. What am I going to do that? Especially animals, they'll, they'll just, they'll stick around longer than they should. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm talking a lot, but nobody else was talking. So I'm going to talk. Um, I see, I think people who rescue other beings who are in distress are the top angels on earth and especially, you know, people who rescue animals. But sometimes I see people rescuing animals that, you know, like an old animal and they keep doing all these things to it to keep it alive. And I look at the animal and I go, I really feel like that animal is just saying please let me die i have nine million lives i'm ready for the next one yeah <laughs> but no the humans are like no let's do this and let's do this and let's keep them going and yeah in autobiography of the yogi they have a story of a deer like that that they kept the deer alive and the deer actually spoke to paramahansa yogananda subliminally and told him look i'm ready to go stop keeping me alive yeah very nice oh, yeah Okay, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> you know, the, the thing about all of these saintly ones, there's always produces a reaction. For example, in the Baal Shem Tov, Baal Shem Tov at one time had to gather his followers around him. He said, stand around me in a circle. And he created a ring of fire around them. He just was able as a yogi to do that because they were being attacked. And uh, it isn't said in anything I've been able to find about how the Baal Shem Tov died. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it was at the hands of an attacker. Certainly that was the case with Martin Luther King. It was the case with uh, with Gandhiji, um, what will happen with the Dalai Lama probably won't be so dramatic. 
but then he's managed to keep his life from being very dramatic, though it's tremendously serviceable, not only to his own people, but to the world. I think Cindy's right. It's nice just to Yes, Uma. Um, I want to share my personal experience of what is like going through intense, continuous pain and the connection of pain to prayer and through prayer finding acceptance, finding solace and beyond that, why? Why am I, oh God, what did I do to deserve this? And then when you question that, and I'm sure many people at some time in their life might have experienced what you or I experience. And the answer that comes from within, oh my darling, I am right now with you. I'm holding you in my palms. And I am with you. I am suffering with you. And when that comes, I know, I know that there is God, whatever name you want to give. But that teaches me also a lesson that it is wonderful to participate and partake in joy, in wonder, in positive, very pleasant experience. But it is even much more helping, much more meaningful when you are going through that dark alley and when you don't see any rain of hope in near future. That is when I think you deeply connect with the Lord, whatever name you want to give, or with your ideal, your leader, or your uh, ideal person whom you worship, whoever it is. It may be a child, it may be your grandma, it may be God. So the way I learned from experience that, oh Lord, this pain is also your prasad, your gift to me. And life is, we all know. Not total joy, not total pain, not total positive experience. So I would wind up by saying that until, until you personally or vicariously experience this kind of extreme of anything you do not know you do not know that there is somebody who is holding you and i love that prayer that you used to recite oh lord hold my hand without yeah. thee i may fall oh lord Pick me up, support me. Without thee, I may fall. So, prayer, prayer is a deep 
heart to heart connection. Prayer is the savior when it changes the condition of the heart. Prayer is your biggest avenue to connect with Almighty, with God. And that's one, what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, Uma. Of course, your sharing is very, is very welcome and very moving. Here's the little song that she was mentioning. Oh Lord, take my hand. Oh Lord, take my hand. Without thee I may fall. Yes. Without thee I may fall. Oh Lord, pull me on. Oh Lord, pull me on. Without thee I may stray. Without thee I may stray. Oh Lord, take my hand. Oh Lord, pull me on. Without thee, I may fall. Without thee, I may stray. Oh Lord, draw me near. Seat me by thy fire. Oh Lord, draw me near. Seat me by thy fire. Thou art my all in all. Thou art my all in all. Without thee, I may fall. Oh, oh Lord, take my hand. Oh Lord, pull me on. Oh Lord, draw me near. Seat me by thy fire. Thou art my all in all. Thou art my all in all. Without thee, I may fall. Oh Lord, fill this heart. O oh Lord, fill this heart. O oh Lord, fill this heart. Thou art my all in all. Thou art my all in all. Without thee, I may fall. Om. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You're more than welcome, dear. It's always a joy to sing that song. Brother Shankara, this is yeah. Hanma. Uh, I think that this quote, when we don't find any relief from pain, Mother Sharada Devi gave a quote. I just want to give that. She said, grief itself is a gift from God. It is the symbol of his compassion. That's what she said. I know it's very difficult when you're in pain to think that way, but that connects. I found relief from this for years. Uh, that is a symbol of his compassion when you, you know, you hold on to God more and more, more and more, you. nearer, nearer, nearer to him, him or her. Would, would you read the quote again from Holy uh, Mother? Grief itself is a gift from God. It is the symbol of his compassion. Sim symbol. 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 It's a symbol of his compassion. I know it's very difficult to see it that way when you are in pain, but when you go into deeper and deeper up, then you start realizing, yes, I am with the God divine. I'm in the space all the time. That's that's what I I thought that would connect well to our discussion today. Yes. And uh, I know we need Rabbi Balsham's many more of them right now in the world to uplift the world. Our topic, Balsham. You don't know uh, that quote that Haima read was from Sri Sharada Devi. Yes, Mother Sharada Devi. Sri Ramakrishna's uh, holy consort. Thank you. Thank you, Arma. Appreciate it. Hey, this is Tom again. Can you hear me? Yes. So thinking about pain, physical pain, I'm lucky. I haven't had a whole lot of intense physical pain in my life. And I don't know how I would respond to long-term intense physical pain. But, you know, if, if pain is a gift from God, also pain medication is a gift from God. Morphine, morphine uh, pain pills, whatever. Uh, 
I remember when this really hit me, I had hammer toe surgery of, you know, hammer toe, your toes curl around and they put you to sleep when they're doing it, but they break all your toes and then they stick wires, you know, in, in there to hold it straight. And I said, well, I'm just going to, you know, feel the pain and live with the pain and so on and so on. But when, uh, when, when the pain medication started to wear off, from the hospital, it really hurt. And I said, give me the pain pills, give me the pain pills. Really? Um, you know, I don't know if there's anything, any type of like spiritual progress that comes from feeling pain. Uh, I don't know, but I that's not my path. That's not what I want to do. I want pain relief, uh, all that I can get. And, you know, then sometimes I might have to face intense physical pain and no pain relief is available. And who knows how I'll deal with that. I'll find out when it happens. Thank you. Well, with the thank you, Tom, as always, for your straightforwardness and your, your, your stories about yourself. Just to give you an idea of what a very advanced, uh, highly evolved spiritual teacher said about pain. Swami Swahananda said to his doctors, whatever you do, do not let me be in pain. Why? Because pain distracts you. You cannot hold your mind uh, on a high uh, plane when you are in deep pain. And this is where what Uma told us was so moving, was that she managed to find a way to connect that pain with the divine. And then, of course, there is this quote from Sri Sharda Devi. And uh, it's all very mysterious to us until we actually confront it. Thank you, all of you, for your sharing. Anything else from anyone? How are we doing for time? What time is it? We have eight more minutes, Brother Shankara. Okay. <clears throat> Actually, I, I'm just remembering even talking about pain. Uh, even uh, Lord Buddha, he tried asceticism for six years, right? Just eating one grain and doing, torturing his body for six years. Ultimately, he realized moksha or nirvana is not in giving the pain to the body. It is following the middle path and keep your mind straight. Uh, that's how I believe, like, the mind is everything. Mind is controlling body. Body is not controlling the mind. Well said, and certainly that is what the Buddha taught us. Do not uh, go to extremes. Do not allow the body or mind to go to extremes. But as far as the painkillers go, uh, I would say be careful because I recently had a surgery where they put me in painkillers and I could see they were having an addictive effect on me. So I actually, after about four days, went cold turkey and was in tremendous pain. And I could relate to what Cindy said though, that my cat sensed that. He stayed near me and tried to comfort me, purring and cooing in his own cat way. So somehow, yeah, animals do have some sixth sense about what we're going through. But we don't, we can't really understand. This, this business of, addicted, of addiction, of course, some people have a temperament that leans that direction. And they must, of course, be careful about painkillers. Um, you know, any kind right. of... And I've had friends who have become drug addicts, and it's so sad to see what... So I said, no, I'm going to go down that path. So that's why I had to go cold turkey off that stuff. Well, good for you and good for your strength. So I think what you're and saying... Good for my cat, because he helped me get through. Yay for Shiva. <laughs>
Um, I think what both of you are saying about the addictiveness of painkillers is is true and important and all that. But there's a there's another side of it. We have these medications that ha that are very very useful, and because of things that I won't go into, and y'all all probably know about the industry. Um, they have been mis misprescribed. Um, there are people, I, I have a longtime dear friend who is actually in recovery um, for alcohol, but she's been in recovery for a long time. And she has uh, had scoliosis all her life. She had a rod put in her back when she was 12 and was in a body cast for a year. And she was hoping a few years back that they could do a new surgery and remove it because she's just in constant pain. And they couldn't. She flew up to New York and went through the whole thing. Nope, she wasn't a candidate for it for some reason. And she's, you know, she's just in constant pain and she has to take, you know, opioid painkillers, you know, they're prescribed, but it's, over the years, sometimes it's just been awful. I right. Couldn't... She needs it. I mean, otherwise her life is unbearable. Well, she's been treated by the medical establishment as a drug addict because she needs these drugs. And they'll like dole them out in little teeny tiny bits and um, she oh. doesn't get high from them. She's, she needs, you know, when you are in that pain and you take a drug like that, you're not getting high. <laughs> You're just getting relief from the pain. I can oh, just. Me, uh, I, uh, me, oh, I, my Shiva just woke up, by the way. I'll show him to you. Sorry. Oh, oh, my camera doesn't work. Never mind. Mm -hmm. uh, may I add one point? Please do. Oh, hmm. One point. Changing this subject toward animal species, I realized when I was four days ago, totally by myself, Bakir was out of town. So my doctor moved me from my home to her home, where I, I am right now. But the point I want to make as soon as the door opened, all her pets, from a big dog to a puppy to a cat, all three of them just started jumping and licking me all over. And I don't go there that often, but they know me. And somehow, I vouch for this. Somehow, animals have a sharper, a sixth sense to feel somebody's pain. And they lick me to show me their affection. And that really is something you have to go through to experience that animals do have some kind of inner sense if somebody is hurting. And they also know how to comfort. And that is a divine thing, I think, human-animal connection. Yes. I'm so grateful to God that what we yes. and there's There's many people who believe that animals are put into our life as our spirit guides when they come into yes. our life and join us. I think there's some truth to that. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Well, thank you. And uh, my own experience uh, is in alignment with that. I've had that kind of comfort from animals. 
Well, I can remember about about 30 years ago, mm. I had a root canal and I chose to not have any pain medication. And, and the doctor told me, that, are you sure you want to do this? And mm. at the time, I was just getting involved in in, in Hinduism and and I wanted, it was an experiment for me. And uh, I went through it and I felt absolutely no pain at all. Wow. Okay. So it, 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 it left me with the, with the impression that a lot of pain is a, is a figment of our imaginations. And but it's 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 so vivid until it's it's hard to accept that and believe that you know when you experience uh, true pain. But I did have that experience, so I know it. It is possible to overcome it. <laughs> there is, you have a great control of your psychic powers, uh, Robert. That's why you were able to do that. Um, very few people would yeah. have that. Very few people. That's true. And, uh, you know, I think you'll find that if pain catches you unawares, yeah. or you prepare yourself for it, yeah. then then you'll find it's a, a, more of a reality for you. Yes. But it left. But it left me now. I don't know if I could do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I really don't. <laughs> you know what? No, <laughs> the, I think you come to a point of no return. You learn to live with it. And I don't mean learn to live with it with a sour face. Learn to live with it, finding joy and solace in little, little things like those animals licking and jumping, showing affection. Yeah. Like some of your friends and relatives taking extra step to comfort you to call you. So there are hidden blessings in everything. And once you start looking at like that, it's okay. It's okay. I can live with it. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. So with that, I will say, Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ki Jai, Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. And may we go forward secure in the knowledge that the mother and father of the, on the opening prayer holds us lovingly and securely in their embrace. So may we be well and in bright spirits. And until next Tuesday, for those of you who choose to join us for the gospel class, thank you for coming. And we'll bid you a fond farewell. So wonderful to have been with you and to have shared with this with you this is the meaning of congregation we gather together and share our spiritual energy jai shri guru maharaj ki jai until later Bye -bye.